Here we go. Right, I think we're live. There we go. Right, so uh, I am here with Chuck Gines. I'm very excited to have Chuck here. He's a Chicago-based social documentary and street photographer. However, as we will come on to during the course of this interview, he maybe doesn't refer to himself as a photographer in the same way that we would refer to him as a photographer. So, Chuck, welcome to my pokey little YouTube show. I'm very humbled that you would come and join us. How are you going? Well, thank you very much, Matt. I'm glad to be here. Um, outstanding, outstanding. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, I think this is going to be something that a lot of my audience are going to be very excited about because it's certainly, you know, I have followed your stuff for uh, about a year, 18 months now, and, and just been more and more involved in the stories, not just of the, the photographs that you take, but of the people and, uh, and, and the, the stories of the people that you photograph. And I think that the, that's what's so exciting for the people that are watching this, that are maybe following my show, that are interested in street photography, of whom there are many, that they're going to be interested to hear straight from you, uh, you know, some of your perspectives and delve a little bit under the surface of, of these pictures because... Um, as I alluded to in that intro, I think that there's some, uh, there's some differences, some very strong differences between the way that you view this stuff and, and uh, everybody else. So I'm going to dive straight in and uh, hit you with the first question, if that's all right. So in, in, in your own words, uh, you know, what is Grit Street photography? Well, Grit Street evolved because there was a lot of arguments when I first got into the street photography community proper about what street photography was. And there was just all kinds of, of, of arguments about that. And uh, so I said, well, uh, I'm just going to create my own style, my own brand, and therefore I don't have to partake in any of those pointless and meaningless uh, debates. <laughs> no, um, now, I, I tend to think that 90 plus some percent of street photography is very super, superficial, uh, mediocre at best, mm -hmm. and therefore I wanted to return my what I was doing to a more political, a more uh, back into the realism um, that this whole genre started from. Mm. I, I think uh, that's what probably sets you apart a little bit is that you're not just content with finding a pretty backdrop and waiting for somebody with a nice hat to walk in front of it, which seems to be, and I, I'm, I don't want to disparage, but it, it, there, there's so much of street photography that comes up online all the time, or so-called street photography, and that's basically as deep as it goes. You have a slightly deeper sort of um, political root, I think, behind that. What's, what, what's the driver behind um, wanting to make your work a little deeper, a little bit more political? Where, where, where's your, where are you coming from in that? Well, I mean, that type of photography is fine, and, and I've done that in the past, and, and I do that sometimes. And I, mm. in my workshops, I teach that that is called recreational street photography. Mm. Um, and I don't have a problem with recreational photography in itself. It's when people have nothing but that in their portfolios, and they are touted as leaders of the industry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean that. Then I then then I have uh, I see this meaningless, non-threatening. Um, most of the time, color is the subject. It's a red wall with a yellow hat, which right. mm. is not what street photography is about. No, it we, doesn't we, really explain the human. We've condition. left. <laughs> we've now entered the world of outdoor fashion photography. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so um, you you want to return this a little bit more to to, to your roots, and you you call yours the social documentary. Um, how, what do you see as like the difference um, in in your opinion between social documentary and and street photography? Where where's that line for you? Well, I don't. I think just like color, the light spectrum. Uh, we can't tell the difference where exactly the difference between yellow and green reside. We can't mm -hmm. tell that dividing line. Yeah, yeah okay. we do know that there is yellow and there is green, right? Sure. So I don't, I don't know where that distinct dividing line is. And mm. I see things as a spectrum. Mm. And um, it all depends what you're talking about. To me, there's the recreational photography, which is the lowest of the lowest uh, rung of all of this stuff that we're talking okay. about. Sure. Um, so... You know, moving on up into more intellectual street photography, I would say Brian Soko, uh, somebody that I interviewed, uh, moves, recently moved to Miami. Um, his work, I would say, is purely street photography, as as street photography, but is all also captures all of his work centers around and captures the universal essence of urban life. 
the stresses, the alienation, the indifference, okay? Mm. His work captures that. And the, to me, that is the highest level of street photography. Mm. He does this in single images, okay? Maybe that's one difference. Um, where I am, and he is, and a lot of other people are moving, the street photographers are moving away from the single image paradigm and into what I've always been into, multiple images, captions, storyline, um, because I'm not a photographer. This is really interesting. Uh, this is, I think, probably, uh, this is the point where anybody watching this, most of them will now spill their coffee on their keyboards. <laughs> Do you say that? Because it's probably the last thing uh, anybody w w would expect you to say. Um, I mean, please expand on, on that, Chuck, if you can, because I think for many, you are the consummate photographer. So tell me why you don't see yourself in that light. Well, because well, as we were talking before, um, everybody, or hopefully everybody, has some sort of almost innate passion that they're just born with. <laughs> yeah. uh, like you were saying, for you, that, that's photography. Mm. And for many other people, yeah. they truly, truly love photography. Mm. Um, and for me, I can't, I can't say that, okay? Um, what I, I love is, is philosophy, the okay. mysteries of existence in life. Mm. Those are the things that have just nailed me since I was a child. Um, also expressing myself, I'm a, I'm a journalist. I have a diary over there that's about five feet tall that I started, I think, in 1981, oh, wow. something something like that. Yeah, fantastic. So the camera, photography, later in my life, was something that, that came in right at the right time that um, allows me to tell a story about these philosophical and political things that I want to say. Mm. Um, so that's the end in itself mm. and not photography, and that's why I don't consider myself a photographer. That's really interesting. So it's really that the philosophy and the politics are where the heart is for you and everything Absolutely. else is just a means to an end. Yep. So tell me, tell me about your, your personal philosophy and your personal sort of political um, sort of like the, 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 the genesis inside you. Like what, what's the, like what's this, what, how does it all start for you? What's the kind of like the core principles for you that then feed out into, you know, the projects that you do? <laughs> Start of a ten. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Well, sure. in a way, okay. Who, like on my website, some of the philosophers that I'm very influenced by: Frederick Nietzsche, Aristotle, um, Ayn Rand, to an, a certain extent. Not to get into her personality because I know a lot of people don't like her. I'm talking about her ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and what motivates me is that I see, and this is why we almost have to get into Nietzsche if you're going to want to know. Go for it. <laughs> what really makes me tick. Okay. So Nietzsche comes along about the same time photography is getting popular. Mm. Right? This is 1850. Marx is right in his uh, uh, capital. Um, we've just, we just did this big paradigm shift from uh, rural life for 250,000 years of evolution into this urban thing. That's why mm. street photography is connected to Industrial revolution this. starts right. to really the, make a all, difference all, to people. All of this stuff comes in. Yeah. So along with that comes, comes science, mm. um, which then questions the old moral paradigm, okay? Nietzsche wrote a book called The Gay Science, and that's where he says God is dead. So Nietzsche puts forth two different things from his view, looking into the future to where we're at now, okay? And he says that there, there'll be one or two things that happen here. Either um, the overman, the superman, which has been misinterpreted so many different ways, it's, it's incredible, or the last man, Okay, which is found in the first chapters of, of Zara through story and, and other places of his work, where he talks about this last man, this sleepy complacency, this this bathing in mediocrity and elevating it to excellent. Oh, does this sound familiar? Right, <laughs> all of my videos. Right. Okay. So he says, "Will man be, be because the old moral code that held man together and all of its religiosity and all of this had been put asunder." Mm. Is man, does he have the wherewithal to hang a new law above his head? Mm. Okay? Okay. Thus comes street photography. Thus spake street photography. <laughs> so so here we guy we got these guys that come in the night. This is street photography for me is not Henry Carter Abrisson. That's mm. not what I teach. Mm. I teach Robert Frank and the Beatniks in nineteen fifties mm. because here we have now that paradigm is finally coming to 
a real challenge, and that's what the beats were all about. We're mm. off with this, and we're going to create, and now the hippies take it, and we're going to create a new world. The only thing is, is that the hippies failed. They did not hang a new law above the door. Mm. They said we will hang no law. The new law is no law. Anything goes. And therefore Anything everything goes. Falls. And this yeah. manifests in, mm. there's no rules of composition. I mean, it manifests in everything. It's in the ice cream, I used to tell my kids. <laughs> everything that we touch. So, and that's where photography comes in and questioning this new paradigm. But for me, so I view the world as, okay, we weren't able to do this, so we are in the last throws here. Right. Okay? And so I want to document this. Right. I so know this I'm is the not... the last throws of the last man. This is the, this is the last man. This is him. Um, um, these phenomenons, like when I talk about Eric Kim, I have nothing... Listen, I want to say publicly, Eric works his butt off at what he do, what he does. Sure. I want to make clear about this. That man has a blog. I don't know. People don't know what it takes to produce content. Mm. And the material that man has on his blog is worthy of all the success in the world. And when I criticize Eric Kim, it's not Eric Kim the person. Sure. And I and I want to give credit where credit is due. But I talk about that phenomenon, okay? Where in the world would you pay that kind of money to go to a workshop for a guitar instructor who only knew three chords? <laughs> and I'm not, I'm just, I'm really, I want to, I want to, now, now that I dropped a name, I want to take it away from the name. I don't want to focus on the name. I want to talk about sure. the ideas, but I just want to, as to get that some bearings sense. of where we're at here, okay? So mm. how does that phenomenon happen? Well, mm. it happens in the world of the last man. Mm. is where that happens. So I know that I'm never going to have any kind of popularity on that level. I have, I'm too controversial, I'm too <laughs> politically incorrect. My objectives are not about that. My right. objectives are, can I, what do I got, 20 years left maybe here if I'm lucky. I'm approaching 50, 72 is about when guys check out. How many of these books can I get together on all of these subjects and the worlds that I've been able to dive deeply into that other people mm. haven't. So 50 and 75 and 100 years from now, mm. when all of the digital information has been erased and no one knows who Zach Arias is and, and they've been long forgotten, yeah. out of the rubble <laughs> will come some hard, tangible stuff that this mm. really wild dude back 100 years ago, I, this is what I think, this is what motivates me. That's so I don't I don't approach this to change the world. I don't. The, the, here's the other thing that probably makes me different. I am probably one of the only or one of the few right of center politically, philosophically, social documentary photographers. Mm. I mean, let's just be straight about this. At least ninety percent of that is on the left. Yeah. Me and yeah. me and Brian Soko right now are not getting along. Political uh, disputes, personality mm. conflicts over that. I will always sing highest accolades to his work. His work stands alone, okay? But it's politically that I have my, my angst with people. Um, not to ramble. Go ahead. No, Ask some more that's, questions. I, I mean, that's, absolutely, <laughs> that, that's fascinating because I think what you're, what, what you're saying is that rather than sort of trying to weather the, um, the, you know, the, the storms of kind of what's in fashion and what's out of fashion with, with photography now, you're trying to put together a body of work that, when the last man has gone and whatever comes next comes next there, there'll be a con because yours follows a consistency of um a, a, of quality and a, a, of a deeper understanding and that will last the test of time and when people look at that in a hundred years it'll have some value rather than looking as cheesy as a instagram filter and you know, absolutely kind of stuff. I, I think that that's something that that i so refreshing to hear somebody say because one of the big things that a lot of photographers struggle with, and I know I struggle with still now to this day, but it's definitely when I started, and I know a lot of the people that, that watch this are, are kind of just getting going with the camera, is how they can develop their own style. You know, what's going to be their voice? How are they going to be, Absolutely. you know, make a mark with their camera and just not make the same sort of derivative, you know, stuff that's gone before. And by having an underlying understanding and, and, and a self-awareness of, of where you are, you know, politically. It doesn't matter if you're on the right, the left, and in my case, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an anarchist and an atheist. I mean, that's where I come from. Sure. I'm sort of a narco a capitalist, a narco, you know, libertarian is where I am politically. But you know, uh, you know, th but there's a, there's a, you have to find out what your core is, and then, and then make the work that speaks to you. 
that's the way to do it. It's not about, you know, oh, well, if I just only shoot in black and white or if I get myself a film camera or if I, you know, apply these, uh, you know, VSCO filters to all my pictures so they all look, you know, a particular way, that would be my style. That's not what it is. It's about something a little bit deeper lasting than that. Have you always had this? How, how's your work changed over the years, Chuck? Oh. In, in what in what regard you mean technic uh, because I, I I'm I, I I am not one of these lifelong photographers um, in a way I mean I've showed those little little instamatic cameras and I used to I've always taken photographs more so than most people around me but never really seriously that didn't okay. start until like 2008 2009 okay um, uh, so I haven't been around long enough, really, to say how has my work changed okay. over the years. I've been doing this about ten years or so. So, I'm going to change up the question a little bit. How has because because for you, it's the the, the, the photography is a byproduct, right? It, it's about saying something about your your philosophy and your your political ideas. So, how has over the years, how has your methodology of of communicating your ideas changed? Well, okay. Um, Moving away from the single image, I guess, mm. uh, and moving into like if you notice, um, uh, I haven't been posting single images or trying not to post single images um, for some time, and I'm getting back into the photo essay. Um, currently, right now, if you go to my website, you'll see I'm doing uh, two different things that I'm following. One of them being um, against doctor's orders, where I'm mm. following a heroin addict uh, who needs uh, treatment for a blood infection but won't stay in the hospital. Um, the other one is getting it together where uh, Teddy, someone that I photographed for about four years now, uh, just documenting the process of what it's like to, for this guy to just to get an ID so he can get some mm. cataract care and what that whole uh, deal is about. Mm. So I'm looking now to put, put things together in more multimedia, you know, text and uh, I just did a Grateful Dead video uh, for the first time I've, uh, and it's probably uh, freshman college year level work um, because I don't know the equipment um, but anyways I'm kinda of proud of it it took me two days to put together nice. but mixing videos and stills and audio and mixing all of these things together to try to capture the essence mm. um, um, I like to write poetry in the heroin book that I'm writing a lot of it is my prose that goes uh, along with the photographs because to me it's a myth. A photograph does not speak a thousand words. People yeah. used to draw on caves prior to language mm. because language was a step up. Mm. And, and, and photographs help assist a thousand good words. <laughs> they can never speak <laughs> a thousand good words. That's why we evolved from cave paintings to language. Mm. Um, that's all part of that artsy-fartsy pseudo thing yeah. um, that I argue with all the time. But, um, yeah, that's how it's changed, from the single image to now looking at um, multiple things, working on putting these magazines together and books I'll be having coming out into the future. And this is what I want to spend the rest of my life doing, mm -hmm. um, is putting these bodies of work together that have a coherent, um, explicit message. Mm. Uh, so it's it's almost like again it's it's the, uh, the the medium is is less important than getting the message out there, isn't it? You know, it's yeah. it's getting the it's getting those stories out. So some of the stories, I mean, one of the things for you know, I'm, I'm sure you know, the many people here obviously tuned in know who you are. For one or two that don't, you're probably most well known for some very um, emotionally difficult subjects. Alley Boys was about homeless people. Um, heroin uh, is, is again it's a project that's that's looking at, at, at disadvantaged drug addicts and 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 the, the the difficult life that they lead and you embed yourself with these people right this is this is not just you're going in for a day like as a day trip as a visitor to take some pictures how how difficult is that because tell us a little bit about the process and, and how you cope with that because I know for me I look at I look at some of the images and it, it's like it punches you there man it's so hard to look at some of those those images and I'm not there it's diffused through a screen how difficult is it and what's your process how do you get in there and and, and work through those really difficult subjects well I think and one of the things I like to tell people because um, I've had people say they want to do the similar thing, and I and I, me and Brian Soko had talked about this before. How you have to have had touched 
that which you wish to document or photograph. Mm. If you're an outsider, it's going to be really, really difficult. It doesn't matter what the subject matter is. Mm. Like, I would have a real hard time doing a documentary on Wall Street brokers. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I, it's not, I'm not familiar with that world. You can't connect so, on any level to that. Right. Yeah. So mm. first of all, I am an outsider. I just got done telling you that I'll never be popular, that I'm the, I'm the guy looking in at, uh, through the window, mm. right, at all of the party going on. I always have been mm. and always will be. So um, I'm counterculture. I'm not mainstream. Um, so I share with these people an outcastness, mm. okay, um, I struggled with, with uh, a lot of drugs. I've done a lot of drugs. I still smoke marijuana and struggle with that. I'm addicted mm. uh, to marijuana. Um, I like marijuana, but sometimes it gets out of control. Mm. Um, that's one of the first things these people asked me, have you ever done heroin? Mm. And I said, no, but I used to uh, cook up uh, crack before they called it crack. Mm. I, so, so, answer your question, I've touched that which these people have experienced. You can so, identify because you felt it. You've been there. Exactly, you've been there. Mm. Yeah. The other thing is, is that, to a fault in a lot of ways, I'm kind of an authentic person. I don't have a lot of filters on my mouth, and kind of <laughs> what you see is what you get. And but how oh, that plays good, that plays bad in some ways, um, especially in the business world when you're trying to make money and get along and work together well with others. Uh, I don't score well with that. Um, but but that authenticity is something you know. Street people are smart, man. Yeah, you're you're, you're not going to shock and jive these people. No. And uh, so, you know, that's that's what allows me to get in is my authenticity. It's one of the seven principles of Grit Street is is authenticity is spirit, and that's and that's what gets me in with these people. They they forget. They've laughed sometimes and say, "Oh, sh forgot you're not an addict." <laughs> right. That's right. how much. I mean, I'm running. I'm everywhere with these guys. Yeah. Um, through the whole entire process. As a matter of fact, I almost. If I would have stayed with it, um, I was about to have access to an actual house where they sell about twenty thousand dollars worth of heroin a day. Jeez, um, mm -hmm. I was able to. I walked up to dealers with cameras on me on these corners and just, <laughs> it, yeah, really crazy. Now that I look back, in hindsight, it's like, who, dude, you are crazy. You yeah, know. that probably wouldn't have been my first reaction. I see some dude that's got, you know, a bit of smack and some money and probably a gun shoved in the back of his chair. Well, they've got the they they've, they've gotten yeah. the nomi. So the, the so dealers you, as well, they know you. You, you have to be authentic. Yeah. You have to, to to have touched, you know, what what it was. and You know, like Don McCollin, who's one of my heroes, the war photographer, yeah. started out as a poor dude mm. and started photographing poor people. And, it, it was uh, his mates, wasn't it? Like that first thing that got yeah. Times um, it was Absolutely. a gang that he ran with. Gang members, you know. Yeah. So uh, I think that's that that that's a real again eye opener for a lot of people that that want to be that want to find their voice. You know, find the people that are around you that that are in in your life or that have things that are in common with you and and tell their story because you know it, it it's you might not have had you know, a, a sort of background of, of, you know, homelessness and drugs and poverty and, 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 and sort of, you know, a hard life. So maybe that's not the thing that you should be going and photographing. Maybe exactly. the thing that you're photographing is, you know, it might not seem interesting to you, the thing that you're doing, because it's just your everyday life. But for somebody on the other side of the world, that's going to be totally fascinating to them because it's not the way that they live. In fact, even somebody that probably lives a few blocks from where your house is, but lives a totally different lifestyle from you, if you can tell that story authentically, and with heart and soul and passion and tell the human stories of the people there. I think that's what it's about, man. It's, it's not about trying to, I think people think that if you want to do documentary photography, you've got to kind of, you've got to, you know, uh, it's got to be something that's very, very difficult and, and gritty and grimy. If you've had that background and you can relate to people, then yeah, you know, if you, if you genuinely, genuinely want to tell that story because you want to make a, a, a difference and you, you can tell that with, with compassion, then do. But don't do it for the sake of getting Facebook likes, for fuck's sake. No. Can I, can I say something about that, though? Yeah. Um, something that you just said. Uh, interesting enough, the last two people that took my workshop concluded, and happily, that they're not industry photography. Right. So no need to waste any more money or time on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I say happily. Um, um, now they know. Yeah, they, well, exactly. It's, it's, you can tick that off the list. You can go and do something else. Right, because here's 
again, do we come to the genre or do we want to uh, mold the genre to fit our needs? Mm, okay. Getting on the subject matter. You know yeah. what? Social documentary photography is not about happy stuff. No. No, true. Not, true. not, not, not yeah. primarily it's not. I mean, historically, mm. um, I mean, that's not what motivates me. No. What motivates me was when I was eight years old, um, sitting up late at night watching uh, uh, PBS and watching the Holocaust footage oh, of them God. scraping bodies into a hole. Jeez, yeah. And then I realized, you know what? Somebody's not telling me the truth around here. Right. You know, I grew up, I had everything. Mm. And my parents tried to shelter me. A lot of my personality has to do with um, the Chicago white flight. I'm part of that whole thing mm -hmm. and trying to shelter from that. And mm -hmm. my whole thing is about breaking away veneers mm -hmm. and looking at things how they are, how they really, really are. And, um, you know, my thing with the heroin is, is to hopefully uh, work towards ending the war on drugs mm. uh, because my conclusion is that uh, the universe is unfair, yep. it is unkind, it is radically indifferent, does not care about our hopes, dreams, wishes, about our visions of equality, mm. does not care about any of that. And that, here's what and here's what happens. It just exists. It just is. Yeah. Some people apparently have genetic lineups and alleles and all of these things that if they snort that stuff, they're toast, baby. Bang, straight away. There is no amount of willpower or anything that is going to resist that biological urge to go and do that dope. Yeah. Uh, and now free will people are going to get all upset, and I'm, I, I'm sorry. It's just not the way life is. So I don't approach, like, uh, changing the world. I don't, like Shaggy right now, I do not have zero, zero desire for Shaggy to get clean. I have zero hopes for Shaggy to get clean. Mm. I cannot afford the emotional investment yeah, so. <laughs> to put my stock in that. Mm. I place my stock is that Shaggy is going to have to have that leg cut off and is going to die mm. right in front of me. Mm. And I'm documenting it and he wants me to document it. Mm. And he probably and, knows too. I mean, oh, of course he knows. We talk about this. He knows that. Mm. He's already dead. Mm. You've seen the photographs of him in that alley shrumpled oh, up with dude. the blood infection, right? Yeah, man. That's that's a dead person who's temporarily still walking around on some fumes. Going but, back to the sort of um, the, the philo philosophical side of this, do you? How much of this do you do you believe in, in a sort of just a predeterminist view of the world, anyway? And how much do you think is is down to just circumstance in in, in the sense that you know it's, he, it's all it's all in there. I mean, free will you know? free free will is in there, okay, but not to the same degree for all people. Um, mm. you, you know, you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, like, right. Like some people are like if you're predetermined genetically yeah. to be more addicted, then you just have one hit of that. Somebody else, you know, I mean, I, might I, struggle I, with it a little bit. Yeah, but ultimately come okay. I mean, I, I mean, I, someone else might not struggle with it at all. Okay, sure. so there's three different things, but they yeah. didn't have any choice. No, so the, no, no, their no. free will, which rides on top of all of those predetermined things, mm -hmm. is limited by the degree of predetermination. Mm. So I don't take either side. I, it's a mixture of both of those. Do you think that's what helps you cope? I mean, because I, I think that that's that's going to be um, an interesting point to, to talk about. Um, just for anybody that is, you know, that they, they, they think they've got what it takes to to get into um, tough situations and tell stories, and they want to, they've got the heart for it, and and they, they genuinely want to help. What advice would you give people about, you know, when you yeah you know, when you when you become friends with somebody like that, and you're sat there and you're literally talking about their own mortality with them, and you know that they're going to die, and you're going to lose a friend at this point because this is somebody you've shot for years. Right. How do you? How do you say to somebody that's coming into wanting to do this? Um, how, how do you cope? Is it you know, what, where's the mindset for that? You know, this is really great, and I, I did a video on this too. And I picked up a little PTSD off of the heroin project and had to back yeah, away. Yeah. But uh, John was uh, the camera guy for the BBC who had who had came down. Um, I was I kind of served as a, a fixer for them, um, and uh, so I took these guys all around and. Uh, uh, what was surprising to me is these guys were seasoned war uh, photographers. Mm. Uh, John was and, and Ian Panel and all these co correspondents from Afghanistan, and they were scared to go over uh, 
into the west side of Chicago. Um, and the reason I, for that is, is today journalism is a lot different than it was before. They have like these little safety zones and all that kind of stuff yeah, um, sure. where we weren't, there's no deal with the, with the, with the vice lords, with the BBC. So <laughs> we're, we're going, <laughs> but one morning yeah. we, we, we had uh, videotaped and uh, uh, the next morning me and John had, had, were on Laura Wacker. And he goes, man, I, I, I couldn't sleep last night. I was looking through all the video footage trying to decide what to uh, put in. And he, he goes, it's just horrific. Mm. And it, I think it was then that I realized what I, what I was doing was on par <laughs> with oh, yeah. war uh, stuff, you know. Well, and what he, but what he said, you know, coping with it, um, he, and we agreed on this, was that it always comes back to loving the people that are in my life more and being grateful for the for the things and, and who and what have been in my life more. Mm. Um, I think ultimately it has to come back uh, to that <laughs> for me. And it was interesting that he had that, that, that same mm. perspective as, uh, about dealing with this uh, kind of stuff because it can be very emotionally taxing, man. Absolutely. And I guess it's not so easy. You, uh, it's probably difficult to – take that stuff home with you, right? Like, you know, how was your day at work, honey? Well, you know, today I saw a guy, you know, with sores in his leg, get it cut off. I mean, that's kind of, it's pretty, it, like, how do you, do you, do you talk about the stuff with your wife? I mean, or is it just something oh, you try and leave it home? Or, you know? Well, what's great about this point in my life is that uh, uh, my kids are raised and uh, I'm remarried with a, with, a, with a new life and uh, we don't have any dogs and I try to keep all the plants rubber. <laughs> so I have nothing to take care of and can take off. Uh, no, uh, me and my wife have a very, very close and loving relationship, and uh, she's a counselor and a therapist. Mm. Um, and no, she's she's actually. She says I feel like I'm friends with these people. I haven't ever met them, right? Um, but kind of vicariously through me. Yeah. Um, so no, we talk about all of this stuff mm. uh, together. Um, absolutely. That's nice. You you obviously have a, a good partnership because just having. Having somebody there that you can talk to and, and you have to, to do this kind of work. I mean, yeah, because it can't be another thing is it can't be about you know the money. No. This is not money money oriented at all. Um, well, we talked you know, about that a bit before, didn't we? And I, th I think that probably would be a good good point to sort of talk about now. Oh, I mean, sure, yeah, we can jettison into that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, anybody that thinks that getting into, I mean, the photography is changing as an industry beyond yes. recognition where in the very embryonic stages of it changing and it's going to be completely unrecognizable in five years, 10 years, 20, all of the avenues that we used to have to make money as, as photographers, we talked a little bit about, you know, in the old days where you'd kind of like, you know, you'd join Magnum or you'd get assigned, you'd be assigned to sure. Life magazine or Nat Geo, whatever it was, you'd go out and you'd get paid, you know, a reasonable amount of money. You know, you might not necessarily get rich off it, but you'd be paid a wage. You could afford to do it. And, and, sure. and and these days, I mean, you know, the, the amount of money you get paid as an assignment, it's like it's probably not going to cover your airfare in a lot of no, places. No, no, it's okay? kind of like I said, the, the second time I went down to Ferguson, I was paid like $147. Right. Um, yeah. So probably better hold off calling Bentley for, for a minute. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> but I mean, that, I mean, I mean, some things are, are all, uh, in general, people don't hire photographers like they used to, used to for all kinds of things, okay? Mm. Well, some things are still always going to be viable. Uh, I mean, um, I'm going next week to photograph some smoothies, those little drinks for oh, some yeah, advertising, right. okay. yeah. you know, for some advertisements because they want professional photographs, and I have the lighting and all that kind of stuff to do that, and they can't do that on their cell phone. Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but that that's really dropped. Photojournalism has been hit extremely hard yeah. um, in in the new age here, and you know what? It's a two-edged sword. I I like it. And I don't like it. Mm. Um, I don't like that I can't, uh, or it's very difficult to be hired as a correspondent somewhere where you could go do this. Or it's even very hard to, in the freelance world to get uh, adequate pay uh, for your work nowadays because there's so much free stuff up there. And we're in the age of consumerism. They're just looking for mediocre photos to be online for five minutes. Blink. Yeah. So they're not willing to invest any, any money yeah. uh, in, into that kind of stuff. So... Journalism is, is taking a big hit, and yet I think there's a special place for what I'm doing because not many people, number one, there's not a whole lot of people doing it, no. this deep kind of stuff. That's why the BBC 
paid me and called me, <laughs> they were able to capitalize on two years' worth of work mm. to put into a story. So there is some market for it, but but it's it, it's very limited um, as far as, as that goes. So you can't get into social documentary or photojournalism nowadays uh, for the money. Um, it seems to me, but to getting on the good part of that is, look at all these cops that have been busted mm. doing foul things, and that's yeah. because of citizen journalism, which I've been a blogger. I was a blogger right after 9-11 is when I hooked up with right. blogs, and I've been a political okay. blogger ever since because I loved I've always been into citizen journalism. Mm. used to do little newspapers prior to that. So I think that's fantastic mm. to be able to get all of that. Uh, uh, that it changes the game. Um, right. Yes. So there's a lot of good things that comes with the technology, and so then as photographers, uh, you're just gonna have to roll with the changes. And for me, um, it's multiple streams of income. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that run to give it away for free uh, market out there. Um, mm -hmm. I don't do that. Some people complain. Uh, we were just talking earlier about someone on your YouTube channel about how I charge for YouTube videos and yeah, yeah. actually outrageous that you charge. I don't <laughs> charge for YouTube videos. And no. All my YouTube videos are free, and I think I have like three teaser videos that lead to my website where I have exclusive content. But um, even if his point had been that okay, you charge for like a subscription on on your website. Yes. Like he, how can you be upset with somebody that that is, is what you know? You 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 obviously enjoy the content. You've been following the content, and they're getting value from that. Unless you support the person that's making that content in some way, how the hell are you expecting them to carry on doing it? These people are not like you know. We're, we're not millionaires. We're not funded. If you want content, then there's got to be some way of monetizing that and 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 keeping it going. Sure. And so how can anybody really have a uh, have a problem with that. And if you do have a problem with that, and you, you, if, if, if somebody genuinely looks at, say, I don't know, my work or your work or somebody says, no, do you know what? That's not worth the, the subscription. Nobody's got a gun to your head. You know, no. It's not like the BBC here where, you know, you have to pay the BBC license fee. It's like, right. the, like you, you can choose. So exactly. don't pay it. I mean, Christ. You know. and, and, that's, and that's, you know, and I knew, me and my wife talked about this. Do you do the give it away for free and ask for donations, which I did mm. for a little while. Yeah. And then, and then I, I don't like panhandling. Mm. Yeah, I just don't like it. I don't. I don't like saying that. So I just said, "This is how it is." Yeah, I'm. I'm going to put unique content on my website, and for the people that uh, feel like having a mutual beneficial exchange, yeah, um, they are more than welcome to do that, and that and that helps. Uh, that's one stream uh, of income, and mm. I'll many. Like I told my wife, I'd rather have a thousand people a year sign up for that and. Mm be willing to have a mutually beneficial exchange for $36 a year. Yeah. Then have 100,000 Twitter followers that give me a, a retweet. Yeah, exactly. Because you can't pay the mortgage with a retweet. Right? Well, I can't. I can't. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. Can we talk a little bit about what goes in? We were talking about what goes into producing material, and I, yeah. I mentioned Eric Kim because I do understand what it takes to go into his... his... The, the amount of content that he puts out, oh has to be said. I mean, you, know, you, you have to... So I just I just published a, a video, a documentary video uh, on my YouTube channel, which I'm going to be going back to, is doing little documentaries mm. of the last uh, Grateful Dead show, mm. okay, which it. required, like I was saying, I had to spend three days, and they were long days. I left the house at like 5.36 in the morning. I didn't get home till 2 in the morning. Dude. <laughs> uh, my feet were literally humming. Yeah. Okay. Now, luckily, <laughs> I was a deadhead. So I was able to get in again yeah. with people, and you yeah. know I'm familiar with it. Cool. But I had to spend three days doing that. I had to spend uh, two hundred and fifty dollars um, to get a ticket to get mm. inside of the show. Right. Then I spent three days editing all of this, three full days. So mm. basically, we had calculated up. I got about fifteen hundred dollars uh, yeah. tied up um, in time and mm. uh, uh, resources to produce a free eighteen minute YouTube video. And that's gonna be that's not gonna be on the subscription part of the website. That's going out free. It's free. It's free. Online. And it's not yeah. gonna get a lot of hits because number one, people are conditioned to seeing stuff about photography on my. And they're uh, going, what's this weird music stuff? What is this yeah. weird music <laughs> stuff? Right. Um, and the other thing is, not a lot of people are into the Grateful Dead anymore. Um, but, <laughs> but but it was something. It meant something to me, and, and I wanted really and I wanted that. to document it. And I'll, yeah. you know, for a lot of people, that is gonna mean something. Um, yeah. The multiple people at that show were saying, "Wow," because they had noticed and seen me over the course of days. 
mm-hmm. um, saying, wow, I am so glad that you are doing this because I haven't taken the time to take any photos. Mm. You know, and there'll be a million people taking photos of the stage. Yeah. You know, but how many people turn around and get to look on this girl's face or down on? See, these are all street yeah, right. photography skills. Yeah, you were talking about that earlier, and about another project that you're you're, you're doing uh, with mixed martial arts, and and how your street photography reactions that that kind of that sense for when a moment is, and how to, how to read things is translated into other things. Can you speak for a minute about um, just what uh, how how street photography then uh, then runs into other styles of photography and what you know what if anybody wants to to kind of learn street photography what what the benefits are to other things that they might do photographically as well sure i mean i'm very grateful uh to street photography for giving me a really solid foundation i encourage everybody to go out and shoot some street photography mm. because like you were saying um, I was a little worried. I hadn't. I have never shot a sporting event before, and here you're hired, so you have to put. Again, now here's pressure. This isn't a casual <laughs> walk down the street uh, yeah. for a Facebook photo. You're being paid, and you have to produce uh, photographs. Yeah. So you got to have first of all the right equipment. Mm-hmm. Uh, not a venue to take a Fuji X100S into. You <laughs> better have something a little better than that. And then you have yeah. to have. And I was just very. I was happy. I. The, the individual that hired me, I was able to nail when he kicked the indiv- other guy in the head and knocked Sweet. him out. Um, <laughs> nailed every key uh, point of the event. Uh, mm. and I was personally uh, very happy with what I uh, took away for that first night. Mm. And I was thinking to myself, wow, I learned a lot uh, mm. all those hours and years out there shooting in the streets. And it does. It really hones in your skills. Because it, you have to know your camera gear. Mm. In street photography, I mean, it has to be literally just like you know playing a s- guitar scales. You can't mm. think about where your finger is going to go next. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I play keyboards, yeah. and that's my thing. And like, yeah, if it's I'm, the same I'm, thing. And, and, it's like, and I, so, I can't play a song. Like, it has to be exactly. And you're not expressing it. Here's what I tell people in my mm. workshops: until you can use this camera like that, then you're not expressing yourself. Mm. Not not yeah. fully. No, because your brain like, is fully in it. Your brain right. is in the gear. It's in the technology. It's not in the That's, moment. It's not in the. It's not in creating the picture. So street photography is very, very challenging because of, uh, you know, there, there's no studio lightings. You're working with the world as it's given. Um, yeah. And I'm very grateful to street photography for that. Yeah. So I encourage everybody to shoot some street. I think that's uh, that, that's a really good point. Yeah, regardless of what your genre is, go out and try it because it, it is. It, it's one of those things that is so. It's so difficult to get right there's so many factors against it and it's very addictive and very rewarding because nobody's there's no like you can't direct anything you know people are people are doing what they're doing you can't kind of get in the way of that and change that you have no control over light you have no control over subjects anything like that so you have to manipulate those things through understanding you know where to move around the image and where to actually set your camera up and then look at what's happening and react to the moment as it's happening to create a picture out of chaos okay and what you just said is why photography is not an art and mm-hmm. why it's important to think this way this is and people in my workshops freak out about this about how it look if I remember one time I took somebody out on, on a workshop and they were taking this photo of some people behind a bus and he was like see how I was able to twist and, and I was thinking this guy is not in the universe here you're not twi- <laughs> you're not twisting anything here yeah, so why is why, well why is this important and here's what I I like to do here's what I do mm. There is this pre-given world out there, okay? So if I walk out in this pre-given world and I say, oh, I'm an artist and I'm going to (laughs) create. No, creation has to do with your will. Like like if we look at a building and a skyscraper, there's absolutely zero accidents. None of those windows just accidentally, by chance, got there. Every yeah, so brick, every, 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 window, brick yeah. every line, every plumbing pipe is there by human will. Yeah. N- not so with photography. This is why mm. it's not an art. We are mm. capturing the pre-given. Therefore, I must come in. I'm not composing. See, art we compose. Mm. Photography we frame. Okay. We come in alignment with the pre-given reality into the best place to meet the empirical criteria for beauty, Mm. we don't get to decide none of this. Mm. We have to come into the right spot. 
Yeah. And that and that's what makes a good photographer is being able to come in alignment with pre-given reality rather than a painter who's creating something. So let, let's just drill down into this. I really want to expand this and, and, and make okay. this um, sort of like abundantly clear to, 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 um, to the audience because I, I think we're, we're coming at this from the point of view of, of a little bit of sort of understanding, I think, of, of this. And I know um, Ken, Ken Wheeler, the angry photographer, has... Has, has has this view as well and I, I think you guys also talked about in the interview you've done with him and it, it's a very underrated um way of looking at photography these days and it's 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 looking at photography as, as an objective documentary form which you're creating you can create beautiful photographs but that's different from creating art like you can't like you didn't create that old lady walking down the stairs like that didn't happen no. like she walked down the stairs you didn't do that what you did was made sure that she was on the rule of thirds or the rule of five or that there was you know a foreground background relationship or that the light you moved around so that the light was on her face you did that stuff but that stuff was all pre-given so I think this is important from the point of view of how new photographers particularly approach their work and one of the best ways that you can actually make a difference to your work rather than just saying, well, look, I'm an artist and therefore everything goes, which is fecking nonsense because as an artist, everything doesn't go. You, you came up with a brilliant way of describing this empirical criteria for beauty. Yeah. You know, the, the, the rules of composition aren't there to be broken. They're there because they work. Tell me about, about this. It, you know, what is it about a good photograph that makes a good photograph a good photograph but not art How, what's the difference there for you well probably the first thing uh, in unpacking this we need to clarify the difference uh, between subjectivity objectivity and between uh, a, a personal taste okay yeah okay and an empirical criteria mm. so let's say that I don't like opera okay and I don't fair play um and let's say that somebody else uh, does not like jazz, and mm. I do. Okay. Okay? That is a matter of subjective taste. Sure. So I, I don't want to belittle subjectivity and the right of people to have their personal opinions and their personal tastes. That's mm. part of it. Mm. But that's only half of the equation. <laughs> okay? Um, then there's the old guy down on State Street whose guitar is horribly out of tune. Mm. <laughs> okay. This is not subjective. He is yeah. not meeting the empirical criteria of beauty. He is falling short of that. Mm. Okay, even though I don't like opera, mm. I can appreciate. Okay, yeah. Puccini's good. The it's beauty just good within, within within it. Okay, I yeah. cannot appreciate Stan's guitar over on State Street. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I just can't appreciate that. It's 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 like the L train coming by. Okay. <laughs> right. And that's that's the difference here. Um, what were we talking about? I kind of lost my my train of thought. So yeah, um, we're, we're trying to unpack the various elements of, of, of what is art. What why oh, okay. why is a good photograph a good photograph? And and so art? what makes What's it the... what what are, what are some of the empirical and why is it empirical criteria of beauty? Well, look, evolutionarily speaking, like I say, uh, these rules of compositions weren't created by some Peloponnesian king or anything like that. This is they were just, they were discovered primarily by the Asians and the Greeks. And, and they're ingrained within the human psyche itself. They have to do with human psychology. And these things were, were discoveries. And we've discovered what tickles the little inner brain and makes people go, ooh, mm. subconsciously. We may not even be aware of these things. Okay? Mm. So these rules of composition are part of the empirical criteria of beauty. Um, and, and when you look at a photograph, when people say uh, they've broken a rule, I can, I've never had anybody say, see, I've broken a rule without me being a, able to say, no, you just employed another rule. Yeah, right. Yeah. I didn't, use the, rule, yeah. I didn't yeah. use the rule a third. I put it in the center. I said, yeah, now you employed symmetry. Mm. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no escaping this. No. So those, those are the technical, empirical things. Then there's um, what's called punctum. Mm. This is the, the Roland Barthes. Um, which is the essence of things, mm. um, the universal essence. And I try, I don't really think about the compositional stuff because I used to oil paint when I was a kid. Mm, okay. All of that stuff comes naturally to me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really, I naturally automatically start putting myself, I, in teaching I've had to slow down what I'm doing so I can figure out what I'm doing so I can teach. 
Um, but I'm more so concerned is where is that essence? Like if somebody's reaching, there's a height of tension in that movement. And if you don't get the photo on the right, if it's over here, mm. you've you've gone past that moment of, of peak tension. Mm. Say someone's putting a number on a sign or something, whatever the case may be. There's a point where there's, kick, you know? there's it doesn't matter what it is, mm. it's, it, but there's a point where there's where it's there. Yeah. And if you can't nail that, and I tell people all the time, why did you shoot that photograph after I took the photograph? Mm. Yeah, right. It's another something you'll have to delete. Yeah. <laughs> Because yeah. there was only there was only that one, but that's what I try to, to to do. So, and I think that if you can do all of those things, if a photograph happens to nail all the compositional and technical uh, aspects and empirical criteria of beauty, mm. plus it nails one of those universals. Um, it has the punk term? It has that decisive moment, the, the crescendo of the right. action within that frame. Then it's a good picture, but it's still not art because that. That action, that well, that, it can be that, just that moment didn't you didn't create that, but it, it can be a part. Itself. But it can be a part of art. Explain that bit. My video is art. Mm. Okay. Because art is art is, is originates in the mind of man, and then man t makes abstractions from reality and then reformulates them into a new creation which did not exist before. Right. So if I take words mm. and I take images and I take videos mm. and I put them into because storytelling is an art. Mm. Okay. Now the video or the book or whatever, that is art because that it's multiple art. abstractions that have been formulated into a concrete. So that's really interesting. Going back to what you were talking about earlier, moving away from the single image to to the project, to the series, to the yeah. books. Is this is this your way of, 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 of taking it away from something that is purely that documentary, however good that you know might may be, however beautiful that may be, and making it art again? Is it important to you that what you do is art? No, it's important that I think of it not as art. Right. Okay. That's what's important to me. Like Don McCullen, I love it. Mm. You know, because like he said, this is why I love Don McCullen, and it's not mm. is. I'm talking morally. I love Don McCullen. I, yeah. I derive my ethics <laughs> from Don McCullen. Um, his photo. I don't. Yeah, I like his photos. Mm. But I like Eugene Smith's photos better. Mm. Okay. I my style of photograph, as far as the the black blacks and the white whites and the contrasts, I try to copy Eugene Smith. Mm. That's my hero. Okay. Ethically, the moral, and the heart and ethically morally, it's Don McCullen yeah. because what yeah. Don McCullen experienced the same thing. When you're looking at somebody who's dying, what in the flip does this have to do with photography? Yeah, right. Yeah. What does this have to do with photography or art? Now, yeah. of course, like Don says, it has to be aesthetically pleasing because you want to draw the person into the subject matter. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. But you can't view this work as art. And you know what that's all about? We live in the age of narcissism, and everybody wants to think that they're an artist. Right. So they want to make photography an art. Mm. But it, that way they can call it. Like Nietzsche said, you know, uh, uh, they make God the judge so they themselves can judge. And mm. they make photography an art so they can consider themselves so artists. artists. Yeah, right. 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 I'll give you one, one, one quick example. I posted a shot of um, uh, the Bowman statue in Grant Park when the sun was coming up, and someone said, oh, right, photography is not an art. And I was like, oh, yeah, right. I took it with my smartphone. I went to Snapseed. I hit two filters and hit post. Yeah, right. So this is, this is, this is the last man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if that's art, then Nietzsche's right. We have arrived at the last man, if that is fine art. You see, this is the thing, and, and, and if you look back, uh, um, like even, even 20, 30 years ago, you got people like Andy Warhol with his soup cans and things like this. I mean, you know, what, at, at what point do we, do we say there must be something higher than just the, 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 the mechanism with which we create something? You know, is, 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 it, is it enough to just sort of take a picture of something and put a snap seed on and then it's, is, is it art? Or, or does it go to those deeper layers? Does it does it go to trying to understand something about the human state? You know, and, well, and we do look. What what look? Art, aesthetics, 
is one of five branches of philosophy. Mm. Okay, and everybody employs these whether they like it or not. It's just there's no escaping it. You can't be alive and breathing and not be a part of these things. It's just a matter of whether you're consciously aware that you're a part of these things or if you just absorb these things through your cultural pores, right. which most people do. Sure. I'm highly attuned of all of, all of these things. Mm. So art is the thermometer as what you tell the health of a society. Mm. So when I walk into the Art Institute of Chicago, and they've spent $16 million or whatever it was on a modern wing, mm. and I look at these splash paintings, right. Uh, big, huge canvases that my daughters used to. I used to bring sheets of drywall home and let my kids throw paint on them. <laughs> I say, oh, here is the sign of a an intellectually and emotionally exhausted culture. Mm. When someone on Facebook says, wow, you are a fine artist because you uploaded that photograph from Snapseed. <laughs> you, well, uh, it's not even really funny, actually. Mm. It's actually quite sad what we're about to go through. Mm. Um, there's too many people and not enough jobs and not enough resources and the next 20 years are not pretty um, and all, all of this pseudo stuff that we see that house of cards is coming down I don't know when I don't know but it's coming it is coming and it's nice guy. that's where and that's why I don't want to partake with look do I want to stand I'll give let's think about this for a minute because Brian Soko took the same photograph that I took different guy there was a sign on a, uh, on a window in State Street that said um, guaranteed. They had some kind of sale going on, and, and the item was guaranteed in the shop window. Mm. And there was also, a, it was around Halloween, so they had a skeleton in the window. Okay? Cool. So here you got, you know, it's your typical street photography juxtapose the sign yeah, between yeah. the. the <laughs> right? And I had waited, I had uh, stopped there maybe for an hour or so every day, waiting for the person to, because people think they're snapshots, and no. A good street photographer is coming back to the same scene time and again. Time and again, yeah. Okay, <laughs> really good street photographers do this. They just don't take one photo and, and post it like mm -hmm. most people do. Yeah. Well, as it turned out, Brian had gone there for six months, wow. waiting for that old, the right old man to come mm -hmm. by. I didn't post my photo because his was better. I had an old lady. He had an old man. But as street yeah. photographers, we've seen the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I had to ask myself. And here's what eventually started happening with, with that type of street photography. I started thinking about, what's Teddy doing? What are the alley boys up to? Mm. What's going on with the heroin addicts over on the west side? How much time do I want to stand here in front of this window, waiting to get the shot of the old lady in front of the skeleton so that I can post it on YouTube and it lasts about 15 seconds? Yeah, and it's cool and it's fun. Mm, but how much time? Really, I only got yeah. 20 years. Hey, the world is coming to it. What What did Henry Cartier-Bresson say to Ainsley Adams? The world is crashing down and you're out photographing rocks? <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of how I feel with recreational street photography. It's for yeah. some people, but I feel like I have a job to do here. Mm. And it's documenting the last of a great run. We went all the way to the moon with this mm. great run that Western man had. Mm. And uh, we're in the last throws. We're in the last throws of it. Yeah. So, and it's all good. <laughs> who, who do you? Well, I mean, that, that's it. I mean, it's, it, it isn't all good. I mean, it's, it's very far yeah. from. But I think you know, knowing that it isn't, and knowing that it's coming down around us, we all have a very definite choice to make in terms of the role that we play in our lives. And I think what a lot of us we'll end up doing is burying our heads in the sand and uh, just going down down the, the pub on Friday night like usual and, and talking bollocks and waking up on Monday morning and going to work. But for those people like yourself that are out there that actually are documenting it, making a, making a, a real coherent body of work that can be understood post this, whatever happens after that, and I mean, it might all be fucking Armageddon, you never know, there might not be anybody to look at this stuff, but right, right, exactly. if we're lucky, and there are people left after this, if they can look at that and go, holy shit, look, this is where we were in 2015, maybe, just maybe, and this is again a big gamble, but maybe, just maybe, we'll have gone beyond that evolutionary and can learn from past mistakes. Hopefully That's a so. big gamble, isn't it? Well, it is, and, you know, the outcomes, you can't, you know, you have to do, I just want to feel that I did what I could do. Yeah, man. And the outcomes, I mean, the chips are going to fall where, where they're going to, going to fall. 
uh, regardless. I just want to be a little bit more serious, and I think there's plenty. I think superficiality has been covered. Other other people got a handle that. on that. Yeah. And and I I just I just want to do uh, serious stuff. You know, right now I might um, I started the Busker Project down in New Orleans, mm. and it just uh, one of the people that was so kind to let me in, into their home. Uh, I'm going to be going back there in October. Uh, has throat cancer. Okay. Um, which I might be doing something on that. I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, it's really, for me, this isn't about photography. It's about the people. Mm. That's, that's, you know, <laughs> I had a, there's all kinds of ethical. Another thing that's, that's changed is I don't post these photographs on Facebook anymore. And that's, me and Brian are, had, had a fallout about that, about where do you post these photos, because here's what happened to me, man. I, I got to, I was in the alley photographing Tony, and I had permission to photograph Tony. I've taken photographs of Tony for years. He's one of the alley boys. And Tony struggles with mental issues. And um, there was one day that he was having an episode in the alley, and I, and I photographed this, and I felt dirty. I got home, and I told my wife, I said, for the first time, man, I feel like I exploited somebody because I did not get permission from Tony, when he granted me the permission, I did not get the permission uh, to photograph him in, in, in that state. Since I've gotten to know him, I know he has a 63-year-old sister that lives in Milwaukee. I know that he has two daughters, right? So now, you, now these are not subjects anymore. These are not subjects anymore. These are people that you know. Yeah, man. And um, so Brian had posted a photo that I don't think he should have posted where he posted it um, because I think he's kind of new. Sorry, I don't. Uh, I don't think he knows that person enough because when you get to really know these people, because I know that person did not grant him permission yeah. to photograph him in that state. Yeah. Definitely, it's beyond. If we're going to be professionals in this, we have to get off of the Facebook uh, deal. And here's the other thing about putting an essay together, about putting a body of work together. If you're going to photograph homeless people and you're going to do this stuff, let's move away from that, shall we? And let's really really get into this. I'm not saying don't photograph it. I'm not saying don't post it. But let's give it some due respect. Mm -hmm. I will post those photographs of Tony, but uh, they're going to be in a book <laughs> about the alley boys and about life on the streets in a proper context. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's something that has also changed. I'm, I'm moving away uh, from that kind of stuff. Um, and and yeah, there are just a lot of moral issues that come up with this work. It's always difficult, isn't it? Because, I mean, if you've got a photo that, you know, was obviously very, uh, very, very moving, um, and, and, you know, I guess one side of it, you, you, could, you, could, you could almost argue that, well, you know, maybe it could shake people up in, into thinking, you know, something about that subject. But I, I think you're right. I think what it's got to be is the broader context of, of the story. Because if you're just tuning in, Facebook is a, is a flip in, flip out thing. You're just looking at that one picture. You've got no context. You don't know who Tony is. You don't know what his story is. You, don't, you just see this guy in, in, in just this terrible state that he's in at that moment. And you have no fucking idea what his story is. And, and so it's like, oh, look at that dude. Like, is he pissed? Is he, is he mucking around? Is he, is he playing dead? What is it? And you don't, you, you don't get out of it what you would get out of having that in the essay, the book, where you learn. You learn what it's about. You learn why he's like that and, and, and what, what the story behind that is and, and what you're trying to say about, you know, what that says about where we are as a society right now and how the hell we can help, you know? Um, exactly. You know, one of the weird things about the message, though, is going to be odd. Um, again, we hear all these things about trying to end homelessness. And actually, I don't have any such, uh, and this is what's different. Mm. I, I, I accept people where they're at. Right. And some, look, it was amazing. It's all a matter of perspective. Actually, the alley boys have a halfway decent life compared to the heroin addicts. Right. I, it was amazing me thinking about this. Because mm. they go and they see movies and they joke around and... Yeah. Um, do all kinds of other things, whereas the heroin addicts, the only thing they do is heroin. Mm. Um, and it's really amazing, these two different uh, communities. But, mm. uh, yeah, uh, getting away from the single images and, and into the photo photo essays is where it's at, at for me, for sure. 
I just want to touch on on one last uh, one sure. last sort of subject before we before we wrap this up because I, th I think that um, a lot of people um, get into following you either through the street photography or through a lot of the, the stuff that you do around film cameras and around analog photography and, sure. and that side of things and and recently um, I know you've been shooting a lot more with digital with uh, mixed feelings and mixed results I know certainly um, you know you upset a lot of the Fuji fanboys with the stuff about the X100S uh, completely fair comments has to be said uh, but you know you use a D700 now and have shot yeah. with Sony A77s how do, do you is there a difference in the way you work between film and digital or is it just a medium are you agnostic in that sense or does it make a fundamental difference when you're actually out there and you're in an alley with heroin addicts shooting up what how does it differ if you're with a say like a like a, a Minolta or a like you know film camera or your D700 well I think the main thing the main difference I think would be how I view my exposures because yeah. with film I'm always metering to my shadows okay uh, and with digital, it's the opposite. You're always you're worried about blowing your highlights. Yeah. Um, so that's one difference. Um, other than that, I mean, I, I stick with Nikon. So like uh, my F4 uh, film camera is very, very similar to the layout of my my D700. There's not a yeah. lot of difference between those cameras. So it does, that that part doesn't matter uh, to me. Mm -hmm. um, there's pros and cons of both of them. I'm a, I'm a film lover. Can I tell you a story? This is really going to... Oh, <laughs> will you break it here first? <laughs> Look, here's yeah, what happened. Mm. Oh, my God, people are going to be screaming. <laughs> Look, I, I was shooting probably close to about 60 rolls a month. Wow. Um, and really develop, cool, as yeah. everybody knows, I make my own developers, and I develop, and I scan, and I'm trying to run this business. And, mm. um, uh, and there's only so many hours in a day. So me and my wife, last time we went down to New Orleans a couple months ago, um, I shot digital and I sh shot film. And we went back to the hotel and I would edit my digital and I'd go to Walgreens and I'd go and I'd make prints because I love to give prints to people, mm. even yeah, the homeless yeah, people. Cool. Yeah. So, and I was able to make the prints and all that and then we drive home and I take it out and I look and I got 14 rolls of film that I haven't even yet developed. Oh, wait, man. <laughs> Whereas the digital... Was already. It's already. They've got the prints. They got the prints. Yeah. Um, and it was just. It just hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, so I have drastically cut back um, on my professional work using film uh, because time yeah. and uh, digital. Uh, yeah. Digital. Digital beats. And I've always. There's nothing new here. I've said all of this from the beginning. Um, I still love the look of film. I uh, mm. always, always will. And I still shoot one or two rolls, but I've drastically cut that down. There's no way I can do it. Mm. Um, but when it comes to the speed, uh, it's really hard to beat digital. And uh, mm. there, there, there's something said to be said for that. And I think what's really interesting, particularly with, with your everything that we've talked about and everything that you um, talk about on your channel as well, in, in terms of, of, of photography, We've talked about punctum, we've talked about composition, we've talked about moment, we've talked about story, we've talked about the people, the character, all that stuff. At no point have we been talking about dynamic range or noise or uh, pixel count or any of this other bollocks, right? So, you know, do, a lot of people that get very het up on those elements, oh, well, you know, film's got higher, you know, sort of dynamic range or digital's better in low light. It's 90, other bollocks. It, it, it's 90% it's of the talk. Yeah, exactly. And we haven't talked about this once because it isn't important to what you do. It's the stories and the people. And no, I mean, once I have my gear, I don't want to talk about gear anymore. No. I only talk about, the only reason I brought up, even made those reviews is because I was looking for some new gear and I bought a camera that didn't do what they said what it was going to do. do. And what they said. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And now I got what I need so you won't see me doing anymore because <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. I'm too busy. I don't have time for that. I'm out shooting photographs. Yeah. Um, that's what I want to do. Uh, you're going to see some changes on my YouTube channel. I want to get mm -hmm. back. If you go to my YouTube channel, you will see that my first videos were um, slideshow presentations of interviews of people that I was doing. Mm. Um, and then I got kind of sucked into the gear. And I, I love doing all that kind of stuff too, but yeah. I'm going to pull back and go back to what you're going to start seeing more of is actual videos that are telling stories have nothing to do with photography. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want that kind of stuff, then you're you're going to have to come over and join my website uh, for that kind of information because I don't want to get I don't want to get sucked into all of that. I want to actually 
be a working photographer and not have time to be making so many YouTube videos. Yeah, fair play. And it goes back into what what is at the heart of what you do. It's about getting that that those political and those philosophical views and expressing them in the best way possible. And um, you know, I think it'll be very exciting to see the channel move in that direction. So um, watch this space. For all of you that are watching this, um, the links to both Chuck's YouTube channel and also to his website will be underneath this. Um, I'm going to put this up on, on my blog with some more um, links in there as well and wherever else it gets shared on the social media sphere. There'll be links to it all there as well. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you for what I think has been just such a fascinating uh, conversation. Um, really, really insightful stuff and uh, I wish you all the best in your future projects. Thanks very much for joining me, and I'll see you all again soon. Cheers. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate it. Peace, everybody. <laughs> Peace, man.